Hello everyone, and my name is Matt, and today I would like to do an unscripted rambling, and hopefully it could turn out as a new series that in which allows me to, without any sort of script, talk about the contents of my heart. <laughs> That's a bit um, emotional, but then uh, I do like some poetry in my words, so hopefully this series would allow the insides of my heart to be transparent to all of you and I don't care really if this has no views I just want to let this out because you know no man is an island oh man what a load of cliches we're having right now Woo -hoo. but really uh, we people aren't really supposed to be alone and so for me I would like to have this sentiment of mine be uh, released into the public wherein I can also generate some sort of discussion in case that it, a certain topic could be made relevant uh, in the future so today I would like to talk about Review scores. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. Review scores. And most specifically, uh, a gamer's intense affection for regarding that 9, that 8, that 10, that digit that's beside. Uh, an assessment or below a written text of a review so back then really I also am guilty of this I used to regard numbers that were attached to reviews as some sort of gospel to be honest I never played games that were below 9.0 and that is on the GameSpot site so any game below 9.0 or at least 8.5 I wouldn't play on GameSpot all of the reviews I used it as some sort of uh, review Bible quotation marks and so I am guilty of this in that I did a huge disservice to myself in what in restricting myself on playing some of the most beautiful most wise most creative games that have somehow missed that arbitrary number of a standard that they used to call back then and so I had to purge myself really in playing the only games where it matched the standard of 9.0 and above if you can even call that a standard but the point wherein I, I thought and I began to have this epiphany of the reality of review scores and its futility in my opinion was when I played Dragon Age Origins now I know Dragon Age Origins was a very unanimously praised game it won several Game of the Year awards back in 2009 it was PC game of the year and it was acclaimed by so many outlets and so many people and Metacritic score is so high and uh, Wikipedia down below and the critical reception has so many stars you can count them and so I thought to myself yes obviously this is the game that will definitely hook me this is a 9.0 and not just that it is unanimously praised by people it won several game of the year awards and so who am I to to judge this game as not worthy of my time because obviously besides the awards besides the praise that number nine in GameSpot which I regard so heavily back then is so indicative of the quality of the game and so back then I said yes I will play this and so I devoted my time playing it and alas to my own dismay I couldn't even get past 
the beginning sections of the game. I thought the animations were weird. I played Mass Effect 1 to 3 back then. And so, I, so I'm supposed to also be uh, forgiving of this game because they're basically the same uh, uh, developer. And I don't know about this, but I am noticing a, a similarity between their engines. The dialogue uh, system is basically the same. And uh, with the exception of the combat, I think I thought the overall structure of the game was also the same. We've got codex, we've got dialogues. It has got RPG um, elements to it, but not exactly full-blown uh, free in giving you leeway on how you traverse the world and, uh, and on how you tackle objectives, you know? So Mass Effect 1 and 3 I enjoyed a lot. I thought that game really deserved the type of structure that it had in accordance to the premise it has. But then Dragon Age, I expected it to be a bit like uh, Elder Scrolls Oblivion. I played Oblivion way before Dragon Age. And so I had already this sense of uh, what I could have been getting from, an, from a future RPG game that was formed in my brain. So uh, upon reading reviews, I, I also read that... Um, Writing is good, and so yes, definitely writing is uh, uh, an essential essential part of uh, of any RPG because most of the time you will be devoting yourself in what in reading, in reading lore, in reading text, in uh, reading the lines of uh, the characters, because basically text and, and writing is some of the most strong strongest aspects that makes a character solid that makes a story good that fully fleshes out an arc and gives more relevance to the canon of whatever uh, literature that that said um, universe is offering to the player and so I played Dragon Age having all of these um, standards already set and so I was pretty excited but then I was surprised that it was it feels so old and I thought also the writing was great I really thought the writing was great but then I also played Dragon Age 2 and Dragon Age Inquisition and for me despite the uh, more nuanced writing I admit that and nuance is very important in realizing your world because it avoids the caricature territory, if you know what I mean. And I do think Dragon Age uh, really deserved some of its praise in its writing aspect because, oh man, do they got Bioware, do they got some really talented writers out there. But the thing that bothered me with Dragon Age that uh, redirected me back to my adherence to the review score was on how please forgive me all those Dragon Age fans on how banal and pedestrian the overall uh, feel of the game was to me yes the writing is good yes the uh, uh, fleshing out of the characters the fleshing out of this world was great but then all this jargon or all this uh, somewhat contrived terms kind of put me off. Unlike Dark Souls or let's say uh, Mass Effect. Man, oh man, am, am I going to get some hate on this? Unlike those games where I thought uh, they used proper timing, they used the proper placement of their jargons in, in incorporating in the world for the player to pick up and to digest uh, just like in Dark Souls for example all the lore is all in the background it's all in the item descriptions it's never intrusive and it's never on the nose and that's what made it for me again my own personal opinion that's what made it 
so engrossing, so mysterious, so oozing in secrecy and uh, in allure for me. Mass Effect also opened up with Shepard. See, what separates Mass Effect and Dragon Age for me was that Mass Effect opened up with character, Dragon Age opened up with lore immediately, you know? And so, yeah, at, within the first minute, I, I thought to myself, okay, well, they wanted the player to uh, be welcome to this world, so of course, this is understandable. And then also they had to incorporate characters into it. And so yes, I thought the characters were great in Dragon Age, just as just as in Mass Effect. But then all those jargon, all those uh, blight, all those fantastical terms were kinda too much for me. And maybe I have noticed too, maybe it's not the game's fault. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I was just too fed up with all this. Game of Thrones-esque uh, fantastical uh, themes, you know? I played Oblivion, I played Skyrim, I played Two Worlds, I played Dragon Age 2, Dragon Age 1, and so all of those things, all those games that I have just mentioned, I, th I thought it was just a timely circumstance that it came to the point in Dragon Age was the only game that told me hey you know what you should stop playing fantasy games and so I I thought to myself wait 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 this is supposed to be a 9.0 game 9.0 is a very solid uh, indicator of the quality of this game and to think that it was Kevin Van Oort, if I was not mistaken, who reviewed the game. Kevin Van Oort is by far my most treasured, my most well regarded reviewer of all time. He reviewed Dark Souls for me, and I resonated strongly with that. He reviewed Demon Souls, he reviewed Dark Souls 2. Bloodborne, and of course, who would ever forget one of the last reviews that he ever wrote, The Witcher 3, which he gave a perfect 10, which also uh, confirmed, even up to now, that Witcher 3 is indeed one of the best RPGs I have ever played. And so I had this connection with Kevin that in every review that he has put out, I will and be sure that is that that review would immediately confirm my affection for that game. So I questioned it. 9.0, I'm going to read the re review once again. Moments after that or, or periods of time after that, it was not just the Dragon Age review that I had problems with with regards to the sort of semblance that uh, the score should have been uh, confirming my own uh, affection for the game. And so, countless reviews have begun, began, to have this sort of discrepancy within my own impressions of the game. <coughs> Excuse me. And back then, I began to notice that it's not actually the review that is the most guilty of giving me or throwing me a curveball. And I noticed and I began to realize that it is indeed the review score itself. And so as soon as I realized that I began to forego my strict adherence to review scores and so I began to focus on the meat of the writing of the review itself and you know what upon embracing that philosophy I began to have this 
reinvigorated excitement in games. That somehow I was free from all the shackles of those scores, unbound from the limits of those digital arbitrary numbers. Now, I'm enjoying a 7.0 game. I'm enjoying even a 6.0 game. Now, even the uh, Metacritic score of 77 or 76 or 85 or 81 or whatever score it has, I am now enjoying them. And so this leads me to one of the most um, poignant realizations that I had in life. <laughs> in life, wow. Once again, hyperbolic folks, I'm very sorry. Just I can't uh, stop being so uh, hyperbolic and so exaggerated in my statements. It's just my character, you know, and so forgive me if I'm being a bit too much. But you know, that's just my heart swoons every time I am. Um, I'm filled with excitement and filled with the hunger on, on, on expressing my sentiments. And so back to my topic. Once I had that realization that scores aren't exactly the be all end all of the quality of the game, I began to have this sort of uh, wonder, really. A wonder and a love of video games. Hmm? And so I'd like to go back to Adam Sester. Uh, he's also one of the most uh, highly regarded people for me personally. I love his views. I love his opinions. I love his stances on games. I love how he goes beyond the consumer's uh, mentality in in approaching games. That for for him. You can look at a game as a product, uh -huh. but then at the end, what you're doing is you're delimiting the actual relevance of games. Because back then, we gamers were labeled as basement dwellers. We were labeled as antisocials. And so for us to only limit even the reviews themselves, for us to limit them, into a very superficial look at games how much they cost how long should we play them how long does this game last how good are the graphics how much is in there how many side activity is in there how many collectibles is in there if you look at games only as that what we're doing is we're delimiting games as food we're delimiting games as products. We're delimiting games as appliances that only seek to function and not to evoke some sort of emotional or artistic resonance from us, you know? And I do get some games to actually are like that. But then, do we have to Im uh, enforce that sort of standard to all of games. Dark Souls is one masterpiece of a game. And when you review it superficially and say, oh man, this is so hard, there's no tutorials, uh, uh, it can be speedrunned in 25 minutes, you know, it doesn't offer any side content, you're basically all, uh, are put in this. Uh, sort of a uh, linear track and uh, the world's not too big you know that kind of thing when you look at it beyond the uh, obvious things that it has uh, for you and look at underneath the design of the game how the combat is affected by the level design how the level design affects your philosophy how it affects your very emotions in approaching the game. How those monster design affects your psychology in believing that indeed the game is actually actually harder when it is in fact not that hard is beyond me. You know? 
And so I would like to uh, give this example, this final example, because I think I've been talking too much and I've been stumbling here and there, you know. If I have been uh, so inconsistent in my delivery, forgive me because I'm not a uh, English speaker in general. You know, I'm a Filipino. And so English is not exactly my primary language, but I do love language in general. I do love English language. Uh, I love. I also love French in general. <laughs> Bonjour, everyone. Merci. Anyways, I've been practicing my f my French a bit. And so, uh, uh, to speak in English is, isn't exactly a. Uh, a very innate nature for me if you know what I mean and so I would like to talk about Dark, dark Souls and uh, in conjunction to that and in addition actually to that I would give a final example of how review scores that are exactly tied down by the more explicit uh, qualities of game like length or, or, or graphics or, or content is actually doing a disservice to games in general and so I'm gonna throw this game out there this is the best game that I ever played hands down because it resonated well with me to the point of leading me to tears to the point of making me realize how powerful and potent the medium is that if only is used properly could be the most powerful could be the most effective mediums of art that can allow an author's message to be conveyed that is way beyond the confines of passive art like films or books or movies so this game is called brothers a tale of two sons Total Biscuit himself has said that it is one of the best games, if not the best, games he has ever played. And to me, no doubt, this is the best game I have ever played. And by best game, I mean the most effective game that used the inherent, unique nature of its medium in delivering its message to player that is never compromised in any way within its very short length and so brothers a tale of two sons i highly encourage you all please play this game as a, a uh, an older brother with a, a younger brother because of course duh, i'm an older brother it's a brother this game through its mechanics resonated with me so strongly that I began to form this uh, realization that is way beyond the usual gaminess of games you know to think about life after having played a game isn't exactly a usual thing for games you know and so I played brothers and I thought how it used its mechanics how it used the controls in that game was so powerful, was so thoughtful, was so creative in that it integrated very very well the actual control scheme itself that by the end it was used by the author or in this case Joseph Farris he's a filmmaker by the way he used that very nature of a control scheme how we hold the controller how we hold the left and right stick to convey such very very powerful messages in the end I thought no game before that had already did it you know and not just that but during its very short length and also this also gives me a uh, some more um, reasons to justify length as not a barometer for a game's quality or a game's uh, justification for purchase. No, the length should always be signified in accordance to how it serves its primary premise. That's it. 
Gone Home is also one of the best games I ever played. It's very it's very short, two hours, one hour, thirty minutes long. But then with that sense of pacing that it had, I would gladly pay sixty dollars for that game to be only two hours long. Than it is if it was five hours long or fifteen hours long of that same style of a game. You know? So back to brothers. I thought the tutorials were well done. I thought the tutorial was very striking in that it not only manages to tutorialize the player, but it also gives uh, context context, and a narrative one at that to how the brother's relationship is going to be, is going to end up, is going to uh, affect uh, the actual game, you know? And this is art, really. Roger Ebert said, Games cannot be art because it's too variable. It's not permanent, you know? When you look at films and books or uh, novels, the author has already established a fixed subject for whomever to, uh, to fixate on and to formulate an interpretation. In games, it's a different thing. In games, we are the ones who are responsible for the kind of art that is going to be produced. And that for him, Roger Ebert, is a uh, problem because there can never be realized an author's vision because it's too interactive, you know? And he do have some points. And that's why a good game developer to be able to transform this interactive medium to art must take that very nature of interactivity into account while making a game. I don't want to uh, spool this discussion or this uh, rambling into a uh, topic about the narrow dissonance because this ultimately boils down to that, you know. When you look at games, uh, li those mainstream games, and uh, see them as uh, sort of uh, very gimmicky in hooking the uh, player into believing that it's very emotional, that it's very uh, uh, poignant, that's very relevant in regards to the emotion that it's displaying on screen. It kind of falls flat down its face when gameplay comes. Because all of those sensibilities that they have been, been forming in cutscenes are completely thrown away as soon as your hand starts to grab the controller. That leads me back to Brothers. Brothers is a game of integrity. Gun home as well. Papers please as well. You know, just last year, her story as well. The gameplay is part of the narrative. The narrative also dictates the sort of game that you're playing. And uh, back to Adam Sessler uh, for a bit. I like how he uh, talked about Gone Home as a game where the story is the design and the design is the story. And to think about games, uh, how it how far it had come. It's just a revelation for me really, you know. Now we have games that are relevant in that they do comment on current things about society, about politics, about uh, social issues, about our very human nature. Just what, uh, just as uh, the Last of Us did, and so to see review scores. Once again, I'm going back to my uh, main topic. To see review scores reflect only the more superficial, the more uh, outward-looking qualities of games. It's just so missing the point. And it breaks my heart to still see some outlets out there, which aren't very uh, famous by the way, still resort to have compartmentalized uh, dissection of a uh, review score like graphics, you know, 8 graphics, gameplay 7, sounds uh, 9, 
a fun factor five and then aggregate them and then somehow there's this imaginary holy arithmetic uh, algorithm that somehow magically transforms all this digits to this <laughs> beholden review score 7.9 voila we have cracked the code this game is a 7. Point oh my word come on man come on man <sighs> subjectivity can never be quantified huh subjectivity can never be tied down with objectivity because what you're what we're doing here is on the basis of a subjective opinion can we be able to at least give it some sort of objective conclusion at the end from a subjective opinion that somehow me saying that my personal experience of the game is so great that I thought the graphics were 7, I thought the sound was 8, and so I, of course, obviously, I will be able to equate them into a 7.9 that is somehow reflective of the whole total uh, quality of the game. Come on, man. Let's look at games way beyond the score. And I'm going back to Adam Sessler again because this is taking me some time I would like to conclude this with uh, one of the tips and in fact one of the strongest pieces of advice he has given to any sort of gamer out there to any sort of gamer who likes to game with reason to any gamer who likes to consume games as an experience and who likes to experience games as an experience that's worth talking about so what he said is this when you play games do not forget to always question why why am I playing this game why is that thing occurring why am I pressing this button why is the mechanics this and that and why am I loving this game why do I hate this game it all boils down to the question of why. And this also can be applied to films or books. Why do I find this specific chapter amusing? Why do I find Game of Thrones structure so compelling? Despite, you know, uh, having the characters uh, being consistently picked up one by one. Having this sort of death that is so dramatic. Why do I love playing horror games where in fact I'm always being scared all the time you know and so when we once we are able to question the whys of consuming art or in this case playing video games then comes the the most important most relevant reasons on how games should be reviewed Games should be reviewed in accordance to those questions of why. In my opinion, huh? So don't go, um, don't go chasing me around saying, Oh, uh, this one so hypocrite. This one so, uh, uh, um, enforcing his, uh, his uh, values on everybody. No, no, no. This is my personal opinion. I'm just sharing my sentiment on video games and on how review scores those digits I'm so particular with those digits as it's so missing the point of giving out a critique of a game a critique is a biased review there can never be an unbiased review because an unbiased review is an objective one and objective reviews do not exist they do exist when you look at um, uh, pieces of equipment. I can look at speakers objectively. They don't sound good. They don't. And even sound itself is very subjective. You know? Who knows? But then I would like to make clear games aren't products. They may seem like one because you're paying for them. But by the end, they are experiences. 
experiences that are enabling us to uh, reflect our own selves into an imaginized scenario hmm? wherein uh, we're safe from all the uh, consequences of the implications of the game that if, if in real life would have led us to our death you know video games allow us as players to visualize and to see in fruition a visualized depiction of consequences that in real life would have put us in peril and if only developers were so uh, well attuned to the craft are wise enough to use that fact of an interactivity to deliver a message that's helpful and not destructive to society then no doubt a video games can only and will only soar to a certain level of appreciation that even the most jaded, even the most cynical, even the most conservative people out there would have no other choice to turn around and to question what is this video games that these kids, those people are talking about? I hopefully uh, I'm hoping that you understand my point, fine sirs, fine ma'ams. I'm sorry if this took too long, but just, you know, I hope you understand my own position in this thing. That video games are supposed to be experiences and not products for consumption. Once again, this is me, Matt, signing off.